that add up. Now here's a big segue. That wasn't much of a segue, but now we're going to talk about another thing, and that is uh, the, the medical legal system. This is a did you know kind of gotcha. The science has created a new revenue stream for attorneys. And guess what they're using as their authority? The very same science we are for the clinical side. Okay? They're getting wind of this. So what are attorneys looking for? They're looking for patients who have survived heart attacks, strokes, disabling diabetic complications, pregnancy complications, whose physicians, whose patients' physicians, didn't refer them to a dentist for periodontal evaluation. That's what the attorneys are looking for. <laughs> Again, if you're looking to motivate yourself to do something here or to be ahead of the curve, this is big news. Uh, this website's no longer up, but when it was, I harvested this and got a screenshot of it. Attorney in Phoenix, he's out there trolling for patients. He's looking for a revenue stream here. I was at a uh, risk management seminar because we take those and we get a 5% or something reduction on our premium, you know, and you have to do that every year, and it's a good thing to do. And I'm sitting there, and, then the, and towards the end of the presentation, this slide pops up. Uh, and the next one, I'll show you. And in it, uh, he said, malpractice considerations. These are questions that the attorney, the jury, the judge are going to ask. Was the person injured by a medical event where the risk could have been reduced by periodontal treatment? Was there significant loss? Can we show that they had periodontal disease prior to the event? Could the MD have been expected to know about the increased risk? Did they refer for risk evaluation? Those are, those are attorney questions. That's what the court is going to be looking at. And now the real question is, what will physicians think about us as dentists when their patients have cardiac events and they find out that the patient's dentist didn't deal effectively with their gum disease? It's a thought question. You know this is going to happen when, when they start reaching into deep pockets. People are going to get pushed up against the wall and this kind of stuff is going to start happening. This is what the courts are going to say. The attorneys are going to say that we now have uh, studies that show an increased risk of stroke, disruption of control of blood sugars, higher incidence of premature births, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So in red at the bottom, in the red box, this is what he told me, this is the risk management specialist said, to the dentist in the room, these are the steps to do with a patient. Number one, educate the patient and then document in your patient chart that you told them about periodontal disease and the oral systemic infection. Work in conjunction with the patient's primary care physician. Form a relationship. In other words, you're going to co-manage the case. Form a relationship with the patient's physician. Document treatment refusal or terminate the relationship at a minimum. I mean, that, and that's what he's saying from a legal point of view. That's how you approach this. This is serious stuff, and your hide's going to get nailed to the wall eventually, as are the physicians when this happens. Uh, sleep medicine. Just a couple of slides on this. Um, we have a role to play in this equation. It's not a huge role. We've not been defined a huge role yet because we can't truly diagnose it. I don't know of any states that allow a dentist to diagnose it, but we know that there are dangers for bad sleep if you have a sleep uh, disordered breathing problem. Did you want to copy that? Okay. Um, so what is hypoxia-induced inflammation? What is it that makes bad sleep bad? That's the question. But why? What's going on that makes not sleeping well heart disease? What makes arterial sclerosis? What makes, what makes oxygen? I mean, what, what is the process there? There's your answer. Remember the same pathways we were talking about before when you have an insult, okay? Well, obstructive sleep apnea, creating chronic intermittent hypoxia, develops what? <coughs> Reactive oxygen species. Now I've got oxy oxy oxidation happening. And remember when we talked about that? That's why this all starts to come together. When I have oxidative stress, what starts to happen? I start getting damage. I start having problems go on in my body, one of which is the upregulation of nuclear factor kappa beta, which produces what? Cytokines. So now I have cytokines. Do you see the parallels between the, the science of periodontal disease, chronic inflammation, sleep disordered breathing, and maybe, who knows, migraines? You know, I don't know how big of a deal I will play. But at least in here, I get the very same, so I'm, right, I'm locked right back into the same pathways. This is the answer to the question of why does sleep disordered breathing matter? Why is it going to kill me 10 years early because of these other comorbidity issues that will develop? And the answer is because I get back to the science. I'm creating oxygenation or oxidation 
um, that kicks in nuclear factor kappa beta that starts the pro-inflammatory process going. And if I have propensities in that regard, genetically or whatever, then I'm going to have these phenotype expressions occur and the disease will manifest.